it's so good to, to be with you here, here this evening and uh, as we approach the uh, Lord God in worship, let's silent our hearts, quiet our hearts and uh, before we hear God call us into worship. you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. I say to the boastful, do not boast and to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with a haughty neck. For not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine well mixed, and he pours it out from it. All the wicked of the earth shall drain it down the dregas. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. Let's sing together from hymn number 196.
of faith this evening is from the back of your worship guide. It comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith. And uh, let's read our confession in unison together. Private Masses, or receiving this sacrament by a priest or any other alone, as likewise the denial of the cup to the people, worshiping the elements, the lifting them up, or carrying them about for adoration, and the reserving them for any pretended religious use, are all contrary to the nature of this sacrament and to the institution of Christ. Jesus Christ, who bore the cup of your wrath in our place, 
so that we might freely come into your presence. Father in heaven, we lift up the congregation here this evening. We give you thanks for the work of grace that is evident in their lives. Father, we pray for those who are hurting and suffering this evening. And especially, Father, as we approach the year end and all of the celebrations and holiday cheer that we will indeed experience, we know so often, Father, that this is mixed with grief for those who are no longer with us. And so, Father, we pray that you would give comfort to those who are suffering and that you would give hope, Lord, in this season when we reflect upon not only the first coming of the Lord Jesus, but also his second, when everything will be made right. Lord, give us hearts that hunger and thirst for the righteousness of the kingdom, which will appear, O Lord, when Jesus returns. Forgive us, Father, where we have fallen short. Give to us all grace necessary to live out the callings that you have placed upon our lives. Help us, Father, to rejoice in the Lord Jesus in every circumstance. And long for the day, Father, when he will return, for we lift this up in his name. Amen. Please stand and sing with me our song of preparation from, from hymn 194.
Again, it's good to be with you. I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning. My name is Ian Hammond. Um, since this is my first time here at Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church, I thought I would share a little bit about who I am. I am an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church in America, your sister denomination, and my call is to be the pastor of RUF International on the campus of Northwestern, where we welcome international students with biblical hospitality, we proclaim the gospel, and we equip kingdom ambassadors. Uh, it's, uh, I love the call that I have during the week to serve on campus there, international students. Uh, one of the best things about it is it brings me into contact with people who have not heard of the message of the gospel and of Jesus Christ and salvation in Him alone. So I, uh, I love what I do there, and I also really love being with the Lord's people on the Lord's Day. So thank you so much for, for having me here this evening. Tonight we are going to be in the book of Colossians. If you want to join me there, we'll be in Colossians chapter 3, looking at verses 1 to 17. As you know, Colossians is a letter written from the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae. Now, he is writing this letter because he wants to encourage these saints in their pursuit of growth in grace. And apparently, they want to grow as well. But some false teaching has crept into the church that has the potential to derail them. And so Paul writes this letter to this beloved church to combat this false teaching on the one hand, and on the other hand, to explain to them the true path to growth in grace. And so let's go ahead and pray, and then we can read Colossians chapter 3. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to your word this evening, we ask, Father, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see the glory and beauty of our Savior. Lord, give to us your Holy Spirit so we might have a saving understanding of your word. We ask all this. In his name, amen. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. This is God's word. If, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above and not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. People never change. Have you said this before? Maybe, maybe you have. Maybe there were apologies and promises, but it happened again and again and again. Promise, 
broken promise after broken promise after broken promise. People never change. Or maybe you have tried to change, but you did it again. You had another outburst of anger, another word of slip from your lips, another drink too many, too many, another illicit click on the internet. I'll never change. You think to yourself. Maybe you have read self-help books or made New Year's resolutions. And you do well for a while, but the end is the same. You are back where you started. I'll never change. True and substantial change is hard. Spiritual growth is hard. You begin to question if it is even possible. Well, the fact is, is that we are all changing, and we're changing all the time. No person is static. And what Paul implies here in Colossians is that we are either being conformed to what is above or what is below. We're either becoming more like the world around us or more like the Christ who reigns above us. And of course, Paul's desire is that we would be conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in these 17 verses, Paul writes a manifesto of sort concerning Christian change. How do we change? How do we grow? How do we make progress in the Christian life? Paul says that this can happen, but how? Well, in these verses, we find three cornerstones for growth in the Christian life. We find that spiritual growth happens only in Christ, requires a response, and begins with the Word. I want to look at these three cornerstones together tonight. Let's look at the first one. First, notice that spiritual growth only happens in Christ. At the center of spiritual growth is Jesus and our union with Him by faith. This is the essential context for growth. This is the prior condition for growth. And because this is the case, Paul starts here and returns here repeatedly. Look with me in verse 1. He says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What is Paul saying here? Yes, he is saying that Lord Jesus came in history. He was born. He lived his sinless life. He died upon the cross. He rose again from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and He will return in the future. This historical reality is true, but He's saying more than that. He is saying that the historical reality of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has present impact in your life now through your union with Him. What happened to Jesus has happened to you through your union with Him by faith. When you came to the Lord Jesus, your old self, under the rule of sin, died. And your new self, under the rule of the Spirit, was born. And when Jesus Christ appears, as we look forward to His second coming, to His advent, we will be made like Him. And so before we do anything at all in terms of spiritual growth, we must first and foremost understand that something has been done for us. When Rick Hoyt, who was born in 1962, when he was born, he was unable to walk or to speak. And though at the time his parents were encouraged to have him institutionalized, they instead chose to give him a very rich and full life, especially involving him in community sports and athletics. And so in, um, eventually, later on, uh, the, a skill group of engineers was able to, were able to give uh, Rick a computer where he could communicate with his family and friends. And so in 1997, Rick spoke to his father and said, I want to run in this five-mile marathon benefit, or five-mile race benefit, for this lacrosse player who was paralyzed in an accident. And so though Rick's father was a military man, he was far from being a long-distance runner, but nevertheless, he pushed his son in his chair those five miles. They finished second to last place. Uh, but it was pure joy. And at the end of the night, Rick told his father, Dad, when I'm running, it doesn't feel like I'm handicapped any longer. 
that realization would begin would be the start of over a thousand races that Rick and his father would do together, including many triathlons. And so in January of 2020, Rick and his father were inducted into the USA Triathlon Hall of Fame. Now imagine with me for a moment, a reporter on the night of that ceremony comes to Rick and says to him, what does it take to finish a triathlon? You might think to yourself, he's, he's asking the wrong person. His dad did everything. He pushed him. He pulled him. He carried his son. And yet Rick gets all of the benefits. He receives the reward. The only reason that Rick finished a single race was because he was with his father. You would think this, and well, you would, you would be right. Paul, by saying that we are with Christ in his death and resurrection, is saying that the Lord Jesus did all the work, and yet we reap all the benefits. He pushed us, he pulled us, he carried us into the new creation. We did nothing, he did everything. This is what it means to be united to Jesus by faith. And our union with Jesus Christ comes before any spiritual good that we might do. You know, Luther, the champion of God's grace in the time of the Reformation, made this dynamic abundantly clear to us. He observed that the imperatives of the law are distinct from the promises of the gospel. And that this, this distinction in Scripture was crucial. Look with me at the second half of verse 13. It says, As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Herein lies the logic of spiritual growth. This is the difference between the gospel and world religion. The gospel says, you forgive because you have been forgiven. Religion says you forgive so that you might be forgiven. You know, the former leads to a life of other-focused love and also of gratitude. The latter leads to a life of thanklessness and the self-preoccupation of either self-righteousness or self-pity. This, this evening, as you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been united to Him. You have died to sin. You've been raised to newness of life. Your life is hidden with Christ on high. And when Jesus returns, you will appear with Him in glory. And so the question is, is do you think of yourself this way? The first step in spiritual growth is to know that you are united with Jesus by faith. You have a new identity, a new status, a new power at work in you by the Holy Spirit. You know, the Christian who understands himself or herself as being in Christ is so much further along than the person who anxiously strives, believing that new life is the end point and not the starting point of Christian growth. Spiritual growth only happens in Jesus. And so this evening, are you in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you come to Him by faith and repentance? Are you looking to Him not only for the forgiveness of sins, but for fruitfulness in this life? If not, you must not try to clean yourself up first. If you do so, you have missed the point entirely. Jesus came for sinners, not the righteous. You cannot earn it. You cannot achieve it. You are spiritually paralyzed. All you can do is receive Him. And in your reception of Jesus Christ, not only are you forgiven all of your sins and declared righteous in His sight because of His righteousness given to you, you are also set free from the slavery to sin. Then and only then can you grow in spiritual maturity. Second, sorry. Now, Paul doesn't stop there. He says that God has acted definitively in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says we are called to a response. The second quarter stone is spiritual growth requires a response. Fundamentally in this passage, there are two responses. The Puritans uh, used to call these responses mortification and vivification. Mortify means to put something to death. 
To vivify means to bring something to life. What are we to put to death? Well, Paul tells us here in uh, two lists. The first list comes in verse 5. He says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. This first list is focused on desire. It begins with this specific behavior of sexual immorality. And then it moves to this, this, this sin's effect upon our character, which is impurity. In other words, sin is, is corrupting. It changes us for the worse. It progressively makes choosing sin easier. From there, he moves to the roots of sin. The root of sexual sin is passion or lust. This is desire out of control. This is a desire out of proportion. It's not just wanting something, it's having to have it. And from this over-desire, it leads to what Paul calls here an evil desire, a desire for something that is morally off-limits, that God does not approve. And ultimately, we see that sexual morality, as is the case with all sin, is an issue of worship. It is covetousness, which Paul says here is idolatry. This reveals the central concern for Paul in giving us this list. He's not merely giving us a list of behaviors that we are to avoid. It is that, but it's more than that. He is describing to us a life, the fruit of a life that serves idols instead of the living God. You know, this is the key insight for Christian change. Many change philosophies do well to pay attention to uh, our life experiences, our past, our circumstances, our relationships to see how they affect the way we respond. But ultimately, they fail to recognize that at the base of things, how we respond to the situations we face in this life is a matter of worship. Are we looking to Christ, or rather, to the disappointing idols of this world? The second list comes in verse 8. He says, But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. If this first list was about desire, this second list is about our words. This list begins with the feelings of anger, wrath, and malice. And then it moves to the speech of slander and obscene talk. These are sins that come out of your mouth. The first list was described in terms of our relationship with God. Are we worshiping God or idols? The second list is described in terms of our relationships with one another. Look with me beginning in verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, un uncircumcised, barbarian, skithy, and slave free, but Christ is all and is all, and in all. You know, the reason we do not lie to one another is because we have been brought into a new community, which is being renewed after the image of its creator. And this new community is not determined by race or region, class or culture, but by Christ, who is everything to us in, in all of those who are united to him. You know, what we, we, you know, what we truly believe about others eventually comes out of our mouths. It might come out as secret gossip or passive aggressive comments or even open hostility. But our words, both online and in person, reveal what we believe about others in our hearts. You know, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what Paul says here is that we should see Christ in, our, in others, and this should set the terms of how we speak and feel about them. And so when an older congregant is disregarded, Christ Jesus is dishonored. When a younger congregant is ridiculed, Christ is dishonored. When a poor person is demeaned, Christ is dishonored. You know, the call in these lists is to put to death sin. Sins of desire and sins of words. We're called to mortify. You know, this is strong language. To mortify means to put to death, to enact the death penalty on our sin, sinful desires. This speaks to the seriousness for which we should take 
sin in our life. We do not coddle it. We cut it off. We do not cater to it. We stomp it out wherever it rears its ugly head. We do not flirt with it. We rid ourselves of it. We do violence to it. We should not lament, as we often do, our inability to overcome that like final stage of sin when earlier on we've welcomed the earlier stages and not been engaged. This is an invitation Paul is giving us to look at our lives and to see where and when sin begins to take root and then commit to cutting it off. You know, when I was a student in college, I heard about a pastor within RUF, which is the ministry I serve, who uh, committed adultery with a student upon her graduation. You know, this had a sobering effect on the entire national organization of RUF. Ministers all across the country, and especially their, their spouses, their wives, asked the question, will this happen to me? Will this happen to my husband? And I remember talking to my campus minister, um, and you know, I'm a campus minister now, and he was encouraging me in this direction when I was a student. I remember sitting down with him at a coffee shop across from him, and I asked, will this, will this happen to me? And his answer struck me, and it stuck with me ever since. He said, you know, Ian, you don't just wake up one day and have an affair. This is down the road of after compromise, after compromise, after compromise. And he surely was correct in this assessment. Surely before this, there were eyes that were not diverted. There was a thought life that went unchecked. There were feelings that went, were increasingly welcomed. There were meetings that shifted from their spiritual purposes. There was secrecy. All along the way, he kept going down this path until turning away from this person was too much to bear. And so he dove in, he blew up his marriage, and he dishonored the Lord Jesus. He could not say no because he had repeatedly and regularly said yes. This is the way sin works. It enslaves us. We put sin to death because allowing sin to run its course leads to destruction. Verse 6, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Not dealing with sin in your life is like neglecting to treat metastasized cancer. It will spread and it will spread and it will kill you. It's like the weed that you know, notice in the corner of your garden that you decide just to let, let it be. And then you come back outside a week later and it's taken over your entire garden and killed everything. Sin is deceptive. Sin is deadly. And so Paul says, put it to death. And so I'll ask you and I'll ask myself, is there sin in your life that you have grown increasingly content with? You know, imagine what will happen if you allow this sin to fester, to grow, to run its course. Sins of desire will lead us to forsake the Lord Jesus. Sins of our mouth will tear our community apart, and they both lead to destruction. I'll add one thing here. The verbs in this passage are all in the plural form. Paul is writing to a community of people, and not just to individuals. Look with me at verse 15. He says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Spiritual growth is a one body Project. You know, we don't flippantly air dirty laundry, but if we are caught in a transgression and we feel that we cannot get out, we must enlist the help of others. We must expand the circle. We must invite the spiritually mature among us into our life. But you know, spiritual growth is not entirely negative. It's also positive. We also must vivify. We not only put to death, put away, put off, we also put on. Look with me beginning in verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Like a new set of clothes, we are put on these characteristics that are fitting for those who are beloved and belong to God. You know, as you read this list of 
attributes, an image begins to emerge, an image of the Lord Jesus. Jesus was the perfect embodiment of all of these virtues. This is a call to Christ's likeness, as we see in verse 13. We are to be forbearing and forgiving as the Lord has forgiven us. This is what kindness and compassion and meekness and patience looks like in action. It looks like the Lord Jesus. It looks like love. It looks like the Lord Jesus who upon the cross said, Lord, forgive them. So I imagine at this point we might be feeling, as I feel, some distance between who we feel we are and who we should be. And I want you to know you might be further along in this than you realize. If you are in Christ Jesus this evening, you are right there with the Colossians. You know, Paul wrote this to these beloved saints because they needed to hear it. And we need to hear it as well. But look what he says is already true of the Colossians. Verse 12, he says to them, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You know, though it may not always feel like it, you are a new person. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, you are a holy and loved one of God. You know, there's something, there's something profound in this. You know, that we must understand. Pastor Brian Habig, um, in his sermon on this text, makes an important observation about verse 10. He says, you know, it's not your old self that is being renewed. It is your new self. You are becoming who you already are in Christ Jesus. It's like putting on a new suit that has been properly tailored to you. Before coming to Christ, what fit you was the sin suit. It was cut in all the proper places. It fit nice and snug. But you have grown out of those old clothes. You don't fit in them anymore. And so when we live a life of service to idols instead of the living God, when we clothe ourselves in those old clothes, what we're trying to do is fit into clothes that no longer fit us. We are going against our new nature. Yes, we must still fight. The Lord Jesus Christ has not returned yet. We have not appeared with Him in glory. But we are not what we once were. We have already put off the old and put on the new. And so we must seek the things that are above. We must make this mindset ours. Third and briefly, notice that spiritual growth begins with the Word. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Here, Paul brings everything back to worship. He does this because behavior change is the result of heart change, and heart change is the result of the word of Christ dwelling in you richly. Word of God taught and sung with thankfulness in the heart that the Spirit of Christ conforms us to Himself. These are God's means of grace. The key word for us here in verse 16 is richly. Our lives should be lavishly filled with attention to the Word of God. Our churches are meant to be pillars overflowing on the Lord's day with wise teaching and with songs that honor and glorify God. It should be coming from the pulpit, yes, but it also is meant to be happening among the members of this congregation. Do you want to grow spiritually? This will not happen without a commitment to the Word of God. Are you committed to the means of grace? Is the Word of God dwelling in you richly? Are you committed to the community life here at church? The road to Christian maturity only runs through the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is a call to reflect, to sing, to, to meditate on, to memorize, to study the Word of God for our, own, for our own good, but also the good of one another. We do this so that we can all live our lives to the glory of God. Of Jesus verse 17 and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him our whole life our works 
in our words is to be done in the name of Christ. To do something in the name of someone means to do it as their representative. We have become commissioned representatives of the Lord Jesus. We are to live lives that honor Him above all. Paul says, whatever you do, whether you're a mechanic, a student, a parent, a teacher, a banker, whatever you do, you do so in the name of Jesus, seeking His honor. You know, this is why we come together as a church. You know, spiritual maturity and spiritual growth is not an end in itself. We seek to grow so that our entire lives might be lived to the glory of God out of grateful worship to Him. And we have much to be grateful for. We were dead in our sins and transgressions. But God has made us alive together in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus returns, we will be made like Him in glory. Until then, do you want to change? Do you want to grow in the Christian life? <coughs> then you must consider yourself in Christ Jesus. You must put to death sin, put on love, and devote yourself to the Word so that we can all live our lives together to the glory of our God. Let's pray. Father, if you would not have dealt with us according to your steadfast love and abundant mercy, we, we, we would have been hopeless. But with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world, our hope is evident. Our hope is in him. And so, Father, in this life that we live now in the flesh, we pray, Father, that you would help us to live this life to the glory of his great name. Father, thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Father, for the incredible patience that you have demonstrated to us. And we pray, Father, that you would build into our hearts reservoirs of gratitude so that we might live this life in joyful, grateful worship to you, our Lord. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in standing. We'll sing hymn 195. <clears throat>
act of gratitude is giving back to the Lord a portion of what he's given to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the ways that you have provided for us in this life. You give us life and breath and everything. And Father, we praise you for the ways you have provided for this church. And Lord, we pray that you would receive our offerings as response of deep gratitude for your grace. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs> 